So one of the things that happens to you as you age is that um, your lens becomes less and less able to flex, to accommodate, right? So remember how I showed you on the previous slide that whenever things moved up closely, uh, the lens has to get poofier so that it can focus those close those light rays that are close in. Well, as you get older, the lens loses its flexibility. And it gets harder and harder for it to flex down so that you can uh, see things that are up close. This is why uh, people my age, a lot of people my age, wear um, uh, bifocals. I have bifocals in these glasses because I have presbyopia, which is old eye, right? And it's because uh, because the lens hardens with age and the, the muscles, the ciliary muscles become weak because they're no longer able to stretch as much as they used to. So they don't get exercised enough, so they start weakening a little bit. Um, so in order to be able to read, for those of us who have this condition, it hit me almost the day I turned 40 is, <laughs> is when it hit me. But um, uh, you have to wear corrective lenses that will bring the focus in a little bit closer. Uh, so if you'll notice, uh, you know, your the comfortable reading distance is about here, and uh, you know about forty some odd centimeters from your eyes, which is about that far. Uh, as you age, um, that reading distance gets longer and longer. Because remember, uh, the the light coming from something close is is bending at an angle, right? So the thing. Uh, light coming from a distance is coming in at a more straight line. So in order to correct for this hardening of the lens, one of the things that you can do instead of wearing bifocals is you can hold the <laughs> you can hold the reading uh, further away from you. Uh, but that doesn't help if you you know at some point you reach the limit of your arms, right? So at some point you have to get um, glasses. Uh, and you'll notice here that the comfortable reading distance um, you know increases with age. Uh, when you're 60, roughly 100 centimeters. When you're 70, 400 centimeters away, where you can read something comfortably if it's 400 centimeters away, which is like four arm lengths away, basically. Um, so uh, you need corrective lenses for that. Uh, and that, that, that happens to most everyone. Most everyone has that uh, situation. That's why you see so many old people with reading glasses. Myopia is nearsightedness. Uh, this is where things are blurry at a distance, right? And uh, I have myopia. I'm nearsighted, right? So when it, I can only see about this far, uh, about that far without my glasses, everything else is a blur. Uh, this is because the, uh, the eye, um, well, there's a couple of reasons for it. One is called refractive myopia. That's because the the cornea or the lens is just misshapen, and so it's not focusing the light well. The other type of myopia is because uh, your eyeball is too long, right? So instead of being a nice ball like that, it's like a football. <laughs> it's kind of shaped like a football. So the result is that the light is actually focused clearly in front of the retina. So instead of being focused on the retina, it's focused clearly in front of the retina. So it gets focused clearly on the retina, but then it travels further and gets blurred out as it actually hits the retina. And that's the cause of myopia. And once again, you get glasses to correct that. Here's a picture of that, right? Here's the, uh, the situation in, in, in A is where you have myopia, right? So the stuff at a distance, remember, at a long distance comes in. And the focal point is actually not on the retina. Instead, it's in front of the retina, which is not where you want it, right? So the focal point is in front of the retina, and so the, but the light keeps traveling, and it when it, as, as, when it hits the retina, it's blurry, right? Because it, it, the focal point was here, but by the time it gets here, it's blurred out. Of course, uh, you can see things that are up close, like here, for example. If, you were, if we were to move that far point up close, uh, it would be okay because the light, the uh, the, le the 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 um, the focusing would actually make up since it's close. Uh, the light is bent at a different angle, so it gets focused at a different angle, so it's clear. So in order to simulate this, what we do is we use a corrective lens. So if you're nearsighted, you get a lens that's shaped like this, a concave lens that's shaped like this. Uh, so the light from a distance comes in and it gets refocused like it's close, sort of, 
and then that close light um, goes into your cornea, gets focused in your lens, and gets properly shot onto your retina. Okay, that's the uh, process of correcting nearsighted vision. Okay, um, so of course, if you have myopia, the first thing you can do is, uh, of course, move the stimulus closer. Right. <laughs> Um, and the distance when the light becomes focused is called the far point, right? So whenever you bring it in, right, and you say, oh, I can see it now, right? That's called the far point, right? Um, of course, you can't always do that, right? If you're traveling and, you know, you can't, and, you, and you're trying to read a sign on the road and you can't see it, um, you, you know, you, you know, you're not going to be able to climb up and look at the sign closer, right? Uh, if you're a student uh, sitting in the back of a class and you're like a little second grader and you can't see the, the chalkboard, uh, you know, you're going to have a lot of problems, you know, if you have to keep going up and looking up at the at the chalkboard. So um, instead of just getting closer to something, you could get corrective lenses, uh, either glasses or um, contact lenses or LASIK eye surgery. Uh, in LASIK surgery, what they do is they take the cornea <laughs> And they make cuts in it, uh, so that the cornea gets so that the cornea flops into a different shape, and that shape is going to uh, essentially refocus the light so that it is focused better onto the onto the retina. <coughs> Hyperopia is farsightedness. Uh, this is where you can see things far away pretty good, but you can't see things up close, right? So instead of the focus point being in front of the retina, the focus point is actually uh, behind the retina. <laughs> so nearsightedness or myopia was caused by the the the, uh, the the eyeball being shaped like a football uh, hyperopia is caused by the football being tipped on its end so the eyeballs too short right <laughs> so instead of being round like that it's like that right um, if you keep trying to look at things um, that are close by, it's going to hurt you, you know, it's going to cause headaches and hurt your eye, right? Um, and of course, they have corrective lenses for that as well. Now, once the light gets focused correctly, once the light passes um, through your cornea and through your uh, lens and gets projected onto your retina, that light uh, is detected by receptors. Uh, the receptors have uh, ch uh, par com the receptors are neurons. They're specialized neurons, and those neurons have a section of them that is packed full of visual pigment vi visual pigment molecules. They're proteins. They're large proteins, and these cells are just packed full of them. And each one of those um, visual pigment, pigment molecules that's living inside these cells is sensitive to light. Uh, the molecules that make up these uh, uh, parts of these cells are made up of two components, opsin, which is a very large protein, and retinol, which is the actual light-sensitive molecule. Okay? Uh, the opsin and the retinol are connected to each other. Uh, there's actually a picture of that in your book. Hang on a sec. <sighs> see if I have that slide. Oh yeah, I do. Okay, I have the slide, so I can, I'll show it to you later. Um, so the opsin and retinol are connected to each other, um, and the transduction occurs when the retinol molecule absorbs one photon. So one photon is traveling through space, and it hits the retinol molecule. And what it does, when that little tiny photon hits a retinol molecule, what it does is it knocks uh, an electron out of orbit from a, from a molecule, from, the, from an atom. It knocks a, an electron out of orbit. So, book knocks it out like, like, a, like a pool, like if you're shooting pool <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the cue ball travels and it hits another, and it hits another ball and it bounce, that, that ball bounces out, that's kind of what it's like. Um, so the retinol, uh, once the retinol loses that, uh, loses that, uh, uh, electron, it changes shape. It changes its shape. It re, it reconforms its shape. And that's the detection of light. That detection of light has occurred when the retinol gets a, 
an electron knocked out of its orbit and changes shape. And that change of shape, that process, is called isomerization, which is this long word right here, isomerization. Okay, that's that process. Here's a cartoon drawing on the on the um, right hand side of rods and cones. It should be obvious to you why they're called rods and why they're called cones. Right? So this looks like a rod and this looks like a actually looks like a butt plug, but it, it's a cone. <laughs> um, here we <laughs> I recorded that. So, um, so here we. Ha this is a micrograph, a, an electron micrograph of actual rods and cones uh, in a retina. Right? They kind of look like this. Um, but if you look here, right? These are specialized uh, neurons with a receiving end and a transmitting end. Right? These are the dendrites of the neurons, and these serve as the receiving end. Where, where the? Uh, I'm sorry. This is the axon and the axon terminals of the neuron and this would be the den sort of like the dendritic part of the neuron that receives information but instead of dendrites it's full of these little um, these are like actual like little kinda like little stacks of uh, of uh, junior mints you know those little candies if you were to stack a bunch of junior mints or coins uh, in a stack uh, these are these are membranes and in, and in living in those membranes, embedded in these membranes here, are the molecules of retinol and rhodopsin. Uh, same here. There are uh, th th there's different types of retinol rhodopsin, but they're all embedded in those uh, molecules that live inside these little stacks of uh, junior mints that are stacked here. Uh, this is a close-up picture of the molecule, right? So this is the retinol part of the molecule. Right? This isn't a close-up picture, it's like a uh, model, I should say, a model of the molecule, right? Oh, I forgot to turn on my timer. Well, uh, I'm going to, I'll go, I'll stop after this slide just to make sure I don't make this uh, presentation too long. Um, but the retinol here, this is the retinol part of the molecule, and this is the opsin part of the molecule, right? Notice they're very large, huge molecules, right, made up of uh, uh, large protein chains, right? So the retinol is just sitting there minding its own business, and then when it gets hit by a photon of light, it changes shape. So it goes from here to here, right? And that is the signal. Once that signal occurs, once that uh, retinol changes shape, um, the uh, molecule this causes a chain of events which op opens up a bunch of uh, a bunch of uh, um, gates that allow ions to flow and that begins the process of transduction that begins the process of converting this change in the shape of the molecule into a signal into a neural signal um, so and what does that look like well so there's a cascade like I said so the uh, isomerization so when the uh, retinol changes shape uh, that triggers an enzyme cascade, right? So all these enzymes start working to uh, facilitate chemical reactions, to start speeding up chemical reactions. So one chemical reaction leads to another chemical reaction leads to another ch chemical reaction, like a bunch of dominoes falling. As soon as that molecule changes shape, that's the first domino that falls. And the other dominoes that are falling are enzymes that get activated in a chain to start chemical reactions that ultimately lead to that neuron firing and saying, hey, I saw light. And this is a cartoon drawing of what that process might look like. So one visual pigment molecule sets off uh, these uh, these sets off these chemical reactions, those chemical reactions set off those chemical reactions, and then those chemical reactions set off these chemical reactions here. So it's a process that continues and ends up eventually that with that neuron firing and uh, emitting a neurotransmitter that says, that indicates that it detected a light photon. 